Better than gold. And the passage is Psalm 19, 7 through 11. Well, it's resolution time, right? Resolutions. I won't ask for a show of hand uh, as to how many of you have made resolutions for this year, but uh, many of us have. Some of you are real formalized and you've already had them written down for over a month. You know what you want to do, what you have laid out for 2011. Others are unspoken and others of you learned a long time ago there's no use. Why bother? Why set yourself up for frustration in February? Just go ahead and uh, and, and save yourself from that uh, emotional angst and trauma. Now, uh, if you didn't do it yesterday, you may as well forget it, right? Because you didn't get off on the right foot January 1. And uh, I, was, I was talking to my wife uh, last night or this morning, and I said, well, I guess I'm not going to exercise this year because uh, I didn't do it yesterday. I didn't do it. Is Johannes in here? Johannes Mutsky, is he in here? No? Yeah? Okay. He and I have had kind of an ongoing conversation about, about uh, accountability for uh, exercise. So anyway, I've been exercising very faithfully up until yesterday, and the, the, the challenge was off yesterday, so I didn't exercise. Um, anyway. We often feel this way, don't we? As we approach a new year, we've got a clean slate in front of us. And I'm I'm, I'm a sucker for it. I really like it. I like the January one. I like to think ahead of, okay, what am I going to do differently? How am I going to live differently? What do I want to do better in my personal life, in my my ministerial life, in my family life? How am I going to do 2011 better than 2010? And for many of us, maybe eh, for many of us, Our Bible reading begins another very familiar cycle, doesn't it? Yesterday found you in Genesis. Probably by sheer willpower, though, because you stayed up very late the night before, so you didn't get up early at your normal time to read your Bible, but you thought it's January 1 and I've got to read my Bible today. So at some point yesterday, you read a few chapters of Genesis and you knew, you even remembered what you read, right? Because January 1st, for the last 15 years, you've read Genesis chapters 1 through 11. You got your reading in, you feel pretty good about it. But for, but for many of us, that cycle begins yesterday and come mid-February or mid-Leviticus, whichever comes first, uh, things, things begin to kind of deteriorate and fall apart. And then by, by February or March, you begin this cycle. Okay, and, and yours might look a little bit different than mine did, but here's, here's how mine plays out. We read the book of Ephesians, then you read the book of Romans, then you read the book of Proverbs and a few Psalms, and then you read Ephesians, Romans, Proverbs and Psalms, and then you read Ephesians, Romans, Proverbs and Psalms until the next January 1, and then you read Genesis through mid-Revelation, and then you read Ephesians, Romans, uh, what did I say, Uh, Proverbs and Psalms, right? But there's a whole lot more to the Bible than just Ephesians, Romans, Proverbs and Psalms. Do you ever come to a verse like verse 10 in Psalm chapter 19 and actually find it far more discouraging than encouraging? I do. I come to verse 10. Psalmist David is writing. He's talking about how wonderful, how awesome God's words are. He gets to verse 10 and he says, more to be desired are they than gold. Yea, even much fine gold. Sweeter than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. And you kind of think, I don't know that feeling. I don't know that experience. In fact, I'm very well aware that last year I pursued gold and honey more than I pursued God's word. And I enjoyed gold and I enjoyed honey more than I enjoyed God's word. Why do we wrestle so, so significantly with this maybe simplest of Christian disciplines, the one that, that we would most expect of Christians to exercise, this discipline of Bible reading. I think it's because we don't really understand this passage. Why don't we read our Bibles? Because we don't really value the Bible. And why do we have such a difficult time valuing the Bible? Well, let's, let's look into this. Let's, let's find out. A little introductory material into this psalm. Obviously, we're diving right into the middle of the psalm. This psalm, uh, many of your Bibles have the heading, The Law of the Lord is Perfect. There's a lot of different ways that this psalm has been broken down, but almost everyone breaks it into two big chunks. Verses 1 through 6 are, are proclaiming the glory of God in creation. 
Verses 7 through 11 are declaring the glory of God in his written word. Some have divided it up as the cosmos, verses 1 through 6, and the commandments, 7 through 11. Or the world, verses 1 through 6, and the word, verses 7 through 11. Or nature, in verse 1 through 6, and revelation, in the last uh, uh, verses 7 through 11 or skies and scriptures it's been it's been divided up in these two main areas and we're just going to look at the second of those two the scripture the word the revelation of God we're just going to look at the word part together this morning and we're going to look at three things about the word and then we're going to walk through some practical application at the end we're going to look at the character of the word the reward of the word and the value of the word the character reward and value Again, this is a very familiar passage of Scripture for many of us. There are six words that describe the Word of God in this passage. You could pick them out easily. Maybe in your Bibles you've already got them underlined or highlighted or marked in some way. Six words. The law of the Lord. The testimony of the Lord. The precepts of the Lord. The commandments of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. The rules of the, of the Lord. All of these are essentially, though they have slightly varying nuances, are essentially synonyms for the Word of God, the Bible. God's Word to man. You've got to remember here, David's writing, he doesn't have the New Testament, he doesn't even have all of the Old Testament, and yet he recognizes that the Word of God, there's this, this incredible character about the Word of God. Even the word fear might kind of throw us for a loop there for a second, and, and uh, different commentaries describe it this w- different ways. The word fear is not technically a word for the word, but it does reflect the reality that Scripture is the manual for the worship of God. Or another, another uh, theologian says, fear is here a synonym for the law, for its purpose was to put fear into human hearts. And so even the word fear is used synonymously to help us understand, okay, we're talking about the word of God, the word of God to us. These words are essentially synonymous in this context. The psalmist was searching for words that emphasize slightly different aspects, slightly different nuances of the word, but he wanted to get a point across that he's talking about God's word. And then there are seven words that actually describe the characters. We have the the seven nouns, the seven synonyms describing the word of God. What are these words that describe their character? Again, you can, if you let your eyes skip through these verses, we see words like perfect, means complete, sound, blameless. The word is sure, it's reliable, it's faithful. The word is right. It it, it has the idea of of being straight and level. The word is right. It's, It's exact. The word is clean. It's flawless. There are, there are, there's no, there's no filth or dirt there. There's no impurities. It's, it's clean and flawless. The word is, is true. It's lasting. It's firm. It is truth. And it's altogether righteous. Verse 9 ends with righteous altogether. Now these, though these words can be studied individually, and again there are nuances that, that make these words different from one another, the psalmist's emphasis here is that the word of God is perfect. It's trustworthy. There's nothing like it. God's word is true. And we use the word true about a lot of other things in our world, but only God and His Word are ultimate truth. And the point that we're to be deriving from David's exclamation about the Word is, is it's, there, there's to be this growing cumulative force behind these words. The law of the Lord is perfect. The, law, the testimony of the Lord is sure. The precepts of the Lord are right. The commandments of the Lord are pure. And so on. And as we read through this, it's almost like a snowball effect. So that by the end of, of David's exclaiming the word of God, we understand, okay, there's something unique about this word. There's something special about this word. Other men's words are not like this word. The character of the word is this. The character of the word is derived by the character of the author of the word. The character of the word is the character of God. These aren't just character traits about inanimate words on pieces of paper. These character traits are are immediately, in our mind, should immediately connect us. Oh yeah, the word's true because God is true. The word is pure because God is pure. The word is righteous altogether because God is righteous altogether. 
Why is this so significant? Because of whose words they are. We heard sung just a minute ago. They are words of power that can never fail. Why are why is it why is it meaningless when some some people say to you, "Hey, you have my word on it." Well, because you already know that their character isn't trustworthy. You already know their character is suspect. I don't trust them. And so why would their word be good to me? But the word of God is just that. It's God's word. And he is trustworthy. So there's this this character of the word of God that is unlike any other word, any other book that's ever been written in human history. The character of the word is the character of God. He is perfect, sure, right, pure, clean, true, and altogether righteous. So there's the character of the word. Now let's talk about, this is the part I've really been looking forward to, the reward of the word. The reward of the word. I think this passage makes very clear that there are four rewards of the word. We could call them maybe the effects that the word has, but I like the word reward better. This is what will happen to you when you get in the word. Here's what the word does. If you want to mark these in your Bible, I would recommend doing it. The word revives the soul. Right there, verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect. What does it do? It revives the soul. Secondly, it makes wise the simple. It makes simple people wise. Verse 8, excuse me, it rejoices the heart. The fear of the Lord, the word of God, rejoices the heart. It enlightens the eyes. Those are the four rewards to us of the word. Now, you might be looking and saying, yeah, but it also says enduring forever and righteous altogether. Those, those are true things about the word of God. But those first four things in verses 7 and 8 are rewards to us. Remember I talked earlier about why don't we read the word of God? Because we don't value the word of God significantly. When we begin to understand the reward of the word to us, we'll begin to value it rightly. The word revives the soul. Let's talk about that. Verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. I actually like the King James translation on that. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. This does have with it the idea of regeneration. The word of God into your life takes a dead soul. And it doesn't just kind of give it a fresh start. It doesn't just, you know, uh, you know encourage you in, in this phrase. This phrase is talking about taking something that was dead and reviving it. Converting it. Making something that was dead into life again. And if we don't have the word of God, we don't have, we won't have a converted heart. Verses 1 through 6 talk about the display of the reality of God in creation. But that is not enough. If we're going to know the Christ that we've sung of this morning, we have to have this book. It's not enough to want Jesus more in 2011. It's not enough to sing about Jesus Christ more in 2011. If you're going to know Jesus Christ more in 2011, it will only happen as you get this in you. This is one of the reasons why it's so significant for us to get this book into us. We won't know God. We won't know Christ any other way. We can stand on a mountaintop and see his fingerprints. But unbelievers can stand on a mountaintop and see his fingerprints. We won't know the true God of the Bible without getting into the word. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. You only learn that in the Bible. You won't learn that from standing at the shore and looking at the ocean. You'll learn some things about God standing at the shore and looking at the ocean. But you won't have a soul that's converted. You won't have a soul that's revived without this book getting into your heart and mind. So, the Word of God revives the soul. And it does, it it does, it converts us, and it does revive and encourage us even after conversion as well. Obviously, Psalm 42, 5 and 6. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why are, are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise Him, my salvation and my God. If you have a word like that, your soul can be revived. Again, you can stand on a mountaintop, but for your soul to be revived, you need this kind of word from God. The word of God revives the soul. The word of God makes the simple wise. 
I am really glad for that phrase. I, I've got some really, really smart friends, and I mean, like, with really high IQs and that sort of thing. I'm thankful that I don't have to have a really high IQ in order to have the Word of God get in me and for me to be wise. I desperately need wisdom. There's only so much I can do with the mental package God has given me, but I can, I can get wisdom. And God says, even for the simple among you, and my hand's raised there, right? I'm the simple among us. I need the Word of God to make me wise. And the Word of God does that. It makes you wise. But it doesn't make you wise if you don't get it in you. Most of us are average. The, the definition of average is, you know, most of us. What great hope is it to know that we can be made wise? You read through the book of Proverbs, the book of Ecclesiastes. These are, these are books that we call wisdom literature, wisdom books. And we can bring those words of God into our lives and be made wiser. Many of you would give testimony to this. There's a business decision that you need to make, a decision in your family that you need to make. And you go to the Word of God, and there's a word that speaks to you, and it gives you the wisdom that you need. And you read the Bible, and then you know what's the next right step to make in that scenario. The Word of God makes wise the simple. It brings that kind of wisdom into our lives. The Word of God makes the heart rejoice. Verse 8, the precepts of the Lord are right. Rejoicing the heart. Haven't you known this experience? You're sorrowing. You're discouraged. You're fearful. You're anxious. Some of you this morning in this room came into this room with real significant burdens in your heart and on your mind. You're weighed down by circumstances. And you need a word from God. And God has given you His Word. So when you're discouraged and you remember that in spite of your in spite of your sinfulness, in spite of your treason against God, God has saved you. When you read through Romans chapter 5 and you remember that while you were weak and ungodly and sinful, yea, even an enemy of God, Jesus died for you. Well, suddenly, that begins to encourage your heart. You didn't deserve to be made part of God's family. In fact, you deserved not to be made part of God's family. Romans 5 makes that abundantly clear. You were weak and ungodly and sinful and even an enemy. And, and while you were all of that, Jesus died for you. Does that, does that even spark just a spark of joy and happiness in your heart? See, I can, have, I can live in really, really difficult circumstances when I understand that there's hope for my future. When I realize that the king has made me his child, I can begin to endure some pretty difficult circumstances. And so there's a rejoicing to the heart. It doesn't mean that your, your circumstances are immediately fixed. But that, that your, your heart, your life, your mind can be, can be encouraged. I, I, um, I think the song, Every Day with Jesus is Sweeter Than the Day Before, is a silly song. I, I don't even think it's true. And I hope that's nobody's favorite song in here. I, I apologize if it is. I don't know that it is. Okay? Um, because it's, not, it's, not, it's just not true. Every day with Jesus is not sweeter than the day before. Some days are really, really hard. And you remember back when you had really, really sweet days with Jesus. And today ain't one of them. And, and on days like that, we need the word of God to bring an encouraging word into our hearts and into our lives. What else does the word do? It enlightens the eyes. Verse 8. The rules of the Lord are true. I'm sorry. But yeah, the commandments of the Lord is pure enlightening the eyes. The Word of God instills true objectives and worthy values. It gives light to your eyes. It lets you see what is right and what is true. Have you ever read the Word of God and you realized, I've been living for this, but that's not the right thing to live for. This is the right thing to live for. It, it gives you right perspective on life and living. It gives light to your eyes. It lets you see what is true and what is real and what is accurate. So you read through the scripture and you realize, okay, I've been laying up treasure on earth. That's wrong. The Bible says it's wrong. The Bible says to lay up treasure in heaven. There's, there's been light that's been given to your eyes to see what is true, what is accurate, and what is right. 
Psalm 119, verse 130, the unfolding of your words gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. Again, echoing the idea of making wise, uh, making simple people into wise people. So there are four rewards to you for reading the Bible. Now, already, does that increase your your valuing of this word just a little bit? I think it should. I think already, just from understanding those four things, we should begin to value the word a little bit more. Okay, this is this is a word that I need. This is something that's valuable to me. I, I, I'm starting to see why maybe it should be more desired than gold. I can see why it would be sweeter than honey from the honeycomb. Verse 11 just comes right out and says it. The end of verse 11 just says... Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and in keeping them, in keeping the words of God, there's great reward. I mean, David's not trying to to hide anything. There's great reward in your pursuit of these words from God. Pursue your reward. Pursue positive effects in your life from the word of God. David says it, and I'm going to say it too. The word of God does reward us. So, when we understand the character and the reward of the word, we begin to, number three, value the word. I don't want verse 10 to be troubling to us. I want verse 10 to be something that actually encourages us and is something that we long for in our lives, something that we desire in our lives. The value of the word, whose word it is and the kind of word it is, makes a really big difference as to how and whether or not we value it. Okay, so in my hand here, I've got a few, a few uh, letters um, from my wife, but she wasn't my wife when she wrote them to me. She was my girlfriend and fiance. These are just a few of them. I have a big box of them, um, and I'm not going to let you read them. Uh, but and I haven't read them in a while. It would be fun. It would be really fun to go back through them uh, again. Jer baby. That's what it says on the, on the envelope. I like that. Um, okay, so, so in this hand, I've got, I've got love letters from my wife. Okay. In this hand, I have the 2010 Office Depot catalog. I went into the, uh, the office and just tried to grab the most meaningless piece of literature I could find. And I think, I think that's about it. Um, at least in my value scheme. Okay? Now, these are papers with words on them, and these are papers with words on them. You can have this. I'll fight you for these. Okay? I'm not going to read this. I-, I don't think I would ever be bored enough to just flip through it. These I love. I mean, this is... this. I, 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 I'm over-exaggerating it, I know. Okay. But why do I value these more than I value this? Because of who wrote them and what they communicate. Angie wrote these and they communicate love. I don't know who wrote these and I don't know that it communicates anything. Okay? Words on a page, words on a page. These are worth almost infinitely more to me than this is. Words on a page, words on a, words on a page, words on a page. And yet, this stack of pages, to me, must be even more valuable than this stack of pages. This must be infinitely more valuable to me than even this stack of papers. Because, why? Why would I value this more? Because of who wrote them? And what they communicate. Um, The fact that it doesn't blow our minds. That God. Chose to communicate with us through his word. Proves that we're we're just not grasping it yet. Okay. The infinite God of the universe. Chose to communicate with us. He gave us his thoughts. His heart. I love the, the title of the book. From the mind of God to the mind of man. That's what this book is. It's God's love letters, if you will, from God to us. So who wrote them and what they communicate or why we value them? 
And in fact, when we really begin to understand this, we understand in verse 10 that the words of God are to be more desired than gold. And I like the way David says it. Even lots of really expensive gold. Okay? You can, even, you can have gold, but you can even have much fine gold. And the words of God are to be desired more than lots of fine gold. Sweeter than honey from the honeycomb. This, this talks about the, the pleasures of life, the things that we enjoy in life. And you know what? The word of God can be and should be for us the sweetest thing in our experience. Knowing God through the word must be, by God's grace, the thing that, that we find sweetest. The pleasure in life that we enjoy the most. More valuable than gold. More enjoyable than honey. It deserves to be read and memorized and meditated upon as Psalm 1 says day and night intentionally with regularity Job says that this word of God is more necessary to him than his daily food now most of us don't get to the end of the day and it's time to go to bed and we're exhausted we fall and we think I forgot to eat again today it's like five days in a row you know we, that does happen with the Word. We do fall into bed and we're exhausted. And we think, oh man, it's been like a week, maybe a month since I've, since I've really sat down and had time in the Word with God. We, we've got to understand the value of the Word like Job understood the value of the Word. He really believed that it was more important, more valuable for him to have the words of God in him than to have bread in his stomach. That is true. It's more necessary than our daily food, Job says. The psalmist David says, it will keep you from sin, Psalm 119.11. We hide God's word in our heart that we might not sin against him. I don't want to sin. I want to sin. I haven't made this a formal resolution for 2011. I want to sin less next year than I did this year. Okay? I don't need to write that down. That's just a common understood resolution every year. Sin less than last year. God says, if you hide my words in you, it will keep you from sin. David also says, it will be a light to your path. I I want to know that I'm making right decisions, going in the right direction, doing the right thing. The word of God will be a light to your path. He says again in Psalm 1, you'll be like a tree planted by a river of water. Healthy, strong, flourishing. And that can be... That healthy, strong flourishing can be in the middle of of dying with cancer. That can be in the middle of going bankrupt. You can be spiritually healthy, strong, and flourishing regardless of outward circumstances. It's your life. The Word of God is our life. Can you hear David's excitement in this song? Remember, the Psalms are songs. We tend to sing with with more emotion, more enthusiasm than than we quote poetry read words and David here is singing and gets to verse 10 more to be desired are they than gold even much fine gold sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb I remember a song um, from when I was a kid from this psalm okay I'm going to sing it are you ready I'm not but I'm going to try it anyway the law of the Lord is perfect reviving the soul The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. And if I were singing at my home with my kids, I'd sing, More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. How many of you like sung that song before? Yeah. Yeah. Um, When we when we tie in some music to it, it, it makes it makes even more sense. This, this word of God is pure, true, powerful. It's a word that never fails. And it is to be more desired than gold and honey. He's saying the word of God in you and its effect in your life is better than anything else you can have. Better than anything, better than any gold, better than, better than any honey. The word of God in you and its reward, its effect in your life is better than anything you can have. Now, all of this obviously demands that you're getting it in you. Right? The Gatorade commercial, is it in you? It's got to be in you. And similar to the Gatorade commercials, you know, where the guy drinks Gatorade and then he sweats Gatorade. 
when you get the word in you, you'll sweat the word. And sweat's a gross word. You'll, it'll come out of you. You won't know the reward of the word. You won't know the value of the word if you don't have it in you. Reading the Bible is not a chore. It's a gift. It should be considered a delight, a gift from God. Communication to us from God. Letters to us from God. It's the from God part that makes that statement significant. Now, there are some in here who who don't read the Bible and have no desire to read the Bible. And before I jump into the application section, I want to give this warning. This warning comes from Bishop J.C. Ryle, an author and pastor many of you are familiar with. Here's what Ryle says. There's an excellent little book called How Readest Thou that I highly would recommend to you. How Readest Thou. It's about getting the word of God in you that that J.C. Ryle wrote. To those who never do read the Bible at all, I cannot comfort you in your present state of mind. It would be mockery and deceit to do so. I cannot speak to you of peace and heaven while you treat the Bible as you do. You are in danger of losing your soul. You are in danger because your neglected Bible is a plain evidence that you do not love God. There is not a single reasonable excuse you can allege for neglecting the Bible. You have no time to read it forsooth. But you can make time for eating, drinking, sleeping, and perhaps for newspaper reading and smoking. You might easily make time to read the word. Alas, it is not want of time, but waste of time that ruins your soul. Those of you who don't read the word and don't desire to read the word, don't see any value of reading the word, my charge to you is to not read your Bible more. But my first charge to you is check for the, for the health of your own soul spiritually. Are you, are you born again? Are you converted? Some application. I wanted to leave you with some really practical, helpful ways uh, to go from here. Uh, because many of you do want to be in the Word. Many of you do. Many of you are in the Word. Um, I've, I've talked with different ones of you about your Bible reading and your Bible reading plans, and I know that you are regularly in the Word. But I think even those of us that are most, most faithful in our Bible reading can, can uh, value and profit from some encouragement in this area. First of all, have a plan. Have a plan. I really do think this is important. And, and you, you know, you could say, well, it doesn't say to have a plan in the Bible. And I could, you know, maybe agree eventually. But I, for us, we need to plan. When we want something done, we, we plan to get it done. For me, as I said earlier, many years of my reading, I'd start January in Genesis and I'd read Ephesians, Romans, Proverbs, and Psalms over and over and over again. Because those were my go-to books, right? I kind of knew what they were about. They were my go-to books. But I didn't have a plan. And so I just went to my go-to books. Some of you might balk at having a plan. Most of you probably are, from, excuse me, are familiar with Robert Murray McShane's um, Bible reading schedule. And obviously McShane is the one who made the schedule, but he also was aware of some of the dangers of having a schedule. And here's what he himself mentioned were uh, some of the dangers. Formality. Just doing it so you could check it off your list. Self-righteousness. Feeling good about it once you've done it. Assuming that you had earned a little more favor with God because you read your Bible today and you knew that a lot of other people hadn't. Careless reading. Right? You got the plan. I read my plan. Check. Done. I'm on my way. Um, And having the Bible reading plan become a yoke too heavy to bear. Right? You think, okay, I've committed to reading, you know, 20 chapters a day. And, you know, after three days you realize, okay, I can't do this. And so, you know, you go back to your Ephesians, Romans, Psalms, and Proverbs. But you can plan for the most important thing in your spiritual progress, and that is the reading of the word. So I want to encourage you to make a plan. Keep it simple if you're just beginning. There are some Bible reading plans out here in the lobby. And I'm going to be, Lord willing, tomorrow posting a a blog on our Hampton Park uh, blog page of some other ideas of ways for you to, uh, uh, some other plans, some other Bible reading plans. I'll have plans, um, everything as simple as... um, five minutes a day for five days a week all the way up to there's one plan that encourages you to read uh, ten chapters a day from different portions of the Bible Um, so 
be, be looking for that, and Lord willing, that will be up uh, for you tomorrow. So my, my point here isn't to try to convince you of which plan to pursue, but to plan to succeed. Plan for something. And, and then let me just take this one really quick aside here. Dads, dads, it's your responsibility to plan for not just your Bible reading, but for your spouses and for your children's. It's your responsibility, dads. You, you need to plan. You need to make sure that the word is getting into your wife and into your children so that they're being profited this way as well. Okay, dad, I want you to feel that burden. On your shoulders, I want you to have a plan for how your family is going to get the word of God into them. And I'll have some plans um, that, that will, uh, some ideas on that blog, in that blog post as well. Secondly, get some accountability. Get accountability. This, this I, I highly recommend, and I actually recommend that you do this even with someone other than just your wife. Okay? Um, get someone who will hold your feet to the fire and someone whom you are willing to have hold your feet to the fire. Right. If it's someone that you don't really like and they're I mean, they're dogging you, you know, you're going to after a couple months, you're going to be like, leave me alone. Don't want to be accountability partners anymore. Get someone who will help you read with someone. Read with your family. That will be accountability. Your kids know when you're reading with them and when you're not reading with them. With children, this could be the most profitable way for them to get the Bible in them. Read with your family. Okay. If, if you've got a second grader, it may not be the, you know, the most helpful thing for, for them to just sit and read the Bible by themselves for 15 minutes in the morning. Now, you may have a really advanced second grader who, who can really draw a lot out of that, but it might be even more helpful for you to sit down with a, as a family. And they're regularly getting the word into them. That's what we're after. Number three, keep in mind that it's going to be hard. We call it spiritual disciplines. Disciplines aren't something that come naturally to us. It's going to be hard. You have an enemy who understands the reward of the word in your life better than you do. And he is going to work to keep you from the word of God. And you've got an old sinful man, a flesh inside of you that's warring against you as well. Romans 7 makes that clear. The good that I don't want to do, that's what I do. So be ready. Be ready. Remember, it's going to be hard. But also remember that there's great reward and it's going to be worth it. While you read, let me encourage you with this. And and with this, I'm going to end. While you read, you need to do two things. You need to, when you're reading a passage, see yourself as the sinner in the passage. I think a lot of times when we read through the Bible, we read David and Goliath, and we think, I'm David. I, you know, I call David. Um, no. Uh, we need to see ourselves as we need to see ourselves as the prodigal son, either one of the two prodigal sons. We need to we need to put ourselves in the shoes of the sinner, realizing we're the ones who desperately need a great savior. And then secondly, and this is most important, look for Jesus. Remember that you're pursuing a person. You're you're not simply pursuing the, the Bible isn't um, the Bible isn't our encyclopedia. The Bible isn't our, uh, you know, our eight ball. What should I do next? You know, swirl it around and turn it upside down. And whatever answer comes up when I flip to Proverbs, that's what I'm going to do. The Bible's not like that. It's not, it's not just a dictionary of, of worldly wisdom. We're looking, we're looking for a person in these pages. And, and if, you want, if you want Christ more, we've sung of Christ all morning this morning. The only way you get him is through getting this word into you. If you want Christ more, if you want to know God better, the only way it happens is by getting this book into you. It won't happen through osmosis. It won't happen through want to get more. It happens through getting more of this into you. Look for Jesus. Remember, you're pursuing a person. You are seeking to know God. And you're watching his plan unfold. As I've taught our teenagers, it's all about the gospel of King Jesus. This whole book is about the gospel of the King, King Jesus, the good news of King Jesus.